Hello everyone, I'm Mike Simmons, the President and Founder of Astronomers Without Borders. Welcome to this uh, hangout during Global Astronomy Month as part of our Astro Arts program. This is a program, continuing program, which is uh, at the intersection of art and astronomy and space exploration. It's a growing program and today we want to bring you something of interest to uh, having to do with the Aboriginal uh, peoples of Australia and the relationship between their views of the sky and, and the way we see it in the Western world. I think it's going to be fascinating. We have some, some really good guests here. We have uh, Dr. Dwayne Homaker of uh, the University of New South Wales. He's actually an astrophysicist, but he developed an interest in the crossroads of science and culture and went and completed a PhD in indigenous studies as well. And now he researches uh, the intersection of Aboriginal Western knowledge about uh, the, the night sky as well as other things. He'll talk to us about that. Matthew Whitehouse is an organist, a composer, and astronomy educator. He's, he was formerly at University of Arizona and has been involved in the outreach program at Kitt Peak uh, National Observatory. Uh, now he is the observatory manager at the South Carolina State Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. He'll be sharing some interesting music with us. And we also have Bob Ekman, who's known to a number of people if you follow Astronomers Without Borders. He is the editor of the Astronomers Without Borders Astro Poetry blog. He's a prolific astro poet of his own, having uh, published a book of astro poems he's written throughout his life, a lifelong amateur astronomer and lover of the night sky. So it's an interesting lineup that we have here. And if you have any questions, the Q&A app should be available there uh, where you're viewing it. If you're watching this live, go ahead and click on that. Put in any comments or questions that you might have for the guests, uh, and we'll, we'll share them and uh, answer the questions. So, so welcome to everybody, and I'd like to uh, start with, with Dwayne, who is down under in Sydney, Australia. And Dwayne, uh, you have some things to share with us having to do with the aboriginal views of the night sky, the indigenous people of Australia. Um, but tell us a little bit about that as a background, too, so we know who we're talking about and, and uh, what they're about. Absolutely. So my name is Dwayne. Um, you might notice from the accent that I am not Australian, even though I'll, I'll say good day and no worries. I'm actually American. But I moved here about how aboriginal people understood the night sky. It's a really fascinating area and I realize that a lot of people who are watching may not be that familiar with Australia or have even been to Australia. So what I wanted to do is share a few things with you about the indigenous cultures of Australia. So Australia is a pretty good sized island continent. It's the smallest continent but it's got a lot of diverse areas. It's got rainforest, it's got beautiful ocean beaches, it's got mountains with snow, it's got forest, it's also about two-thirds desert. But about 60,000 years ago, 50 or 60,000 years ago, humans first immigrated to Australia from Southeast Asia. And these Aboriginal people have remained relatively isolated on Australia for, for most of that time until the last few hundred years. And during that time, they've created these tremendous um, oral traditions around astronomy. And that's the area that I've, I find of amazing interest in particular and what I wanted to share a bit with you today. Now before I go on I, I do want to emphasize that there isn't a single Aboriginal view of the night sky. There are hundreds. And um, we have an image coming up that uh, shows Australia in a bunch of what look like colored blobs across the country. Each one of those colored areas is a different major language group and each language group is quite distinct. Each one of those groups has their own laws, their own customs, their own language, their own traditions, and of course their own views of the night sky. So you can see this tremendous diversity all across Australia. So when we talk about Aboriginal astronomy, we're really saying Aboriginal astronomies, because there are many different kinds. And I want to talk to you a bit about how some of those are viewed. Um, when we tend to think of constellations in the sky, we think of bright spaces, bright, bright stars where you connect the dots. And Aboriginal cultures had some examples of that. But for the most part, the celestial objects 
were used in stories to notify the people about uh, seasonal change, about keeping time, about navigation, uh, what we call food economics, so mm -hmm. hunting, gathering, fishing. They also had a social purpose. So you look at ceremony, you look at uh, laws and customs. Uh, when you were born, you might be given a totem, and that totem could be an animal, it could be a place, an object. It could also be something relating to astronomy, like or the sound of the moon. So you had a tremendous amount of scientific information about astronomy that's actually encoded in these oral traditions. So what I want to get back to is telling you a couple of different stories about Aboriginal astronomy and giving you a sense of how this stuff is incorporated into their oral traditions and their art forms in particular. So if we actually look at the night sky from Australia, it's going to be completely different, obviously, to what you see in the Northern Hemisphere. We've got a lot of things down south in the sky that you can't see very well from the Northern Hemisphere unless you're near the equator. Uh, we see the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. You see the Southern Cross, which is the most famous constellation in the Southern Hemisphere. It's on several national flags. We can see the Magellanic Clouds. The sky is much more crowded down here than it is up north. So when I first came to Australia, that was one thing that really blew me away when I actually got out of the city and got a chance to see the proper dark night skies. Um, so like I mentioned before, we tend to think of constellations being bright stars, we connect the dots. But in Aboriginal cultures, some of the constellations were not made up of bright spots, but they were made up of dark spaces in the Milky Way. So if you get really dark skies, obviously not from the cities like Sydney or Melbourne, but if you get out of the cities and you look up the sky, you can see dark spaces within the Milky Way. Astronomers call these absorption nebula. We're not going to go into any detail, but they're just areas of cool gas and dust that absorb the background light. But right next to the Southern Cross is a famous dark nebula called the Colsac. And this represents the head of a very famous Australian animal, the emu. And through the Milky Way, going from the Southern Cross all the way down to Scorpius in the center of the Milky Way, it traces out this beautiful silhouette of an emu in the sky. Um, you find this all across Australia, from Sydney all the way over to Western Australia, Territory down to Victoria, South Australia. You find it all over the place. And it's, it's a beautiful constellation. Like I said, it's not made up of the bright stars. It's made up of the dark spaces in the Milky Way. And the emu in the sky actually coincides with some of the behavior patterns of the emus themselves. And what we'd like to do now is show you a very short little video of an Aboriginal man from the Camilleroy Nation, which is in the northern central part of New South Wales, telling you a bit about Dinawan. And Dinawan is the emu in the sky. We'll get that video up in just a second. Here we are. I'd just like to talk about um, some traditional knowledge that was handed down to most of us indigenous fellows in this area and it's um, the emu in the sky. Around April, May every year the emu will appear in the Milky Way. Just underneath the Southern Cross you'll see a dark spot, a rounded dark spot. That's the head of the emu. In front of him of course is his beak and as we follow it down you can see his neck in the dark spots of the Milky Way. Comes right down to his body. You can see his legs. And you can see a couple of eggs underneath. At that certain time of year, it's the time that, for us to go out and collect emu eggs. We go out, of course, into the bush 
always leaving some eggs for next year and for the generations to keep going. They only last up until early June. Any time after early June, they start getting chicks in them. But before that, from April, May, you're pretty right to go gather. So that's a great little video that tells you very briefly about how Aboriginal people saw the emu in the sky and how they used it. So the emu in the sky starts to appear right now in Australia. This is just after sunset. When the sun goes down and the stars start to come out. Of course, if you're not in the city, you see the emu coming above, rising above the eastern horizon. It's really beautiful. Once you see it for the first time, you'll never see it the same again. You'll always clearly see the emu. And for those of you who might not be familiar with what an emu is, it looks just like an ostrich. It's like the Australian equivalent of an ostrich. Very large, flightless bird. Now, hmm. when you see the emu in the sky in the evening, at this time of the year, as you said, that's when the emus begin laying their eggs. It's the emu breeding season. So Aboriginal people have noted that when the silhouette of the emu in the sky comes up, that's when the emus start laying their eggs. They go out they begin collecting emu eggs. Now, you might have noticed something a little strange. When he was talking about the emu in the sky, he didn't refer to the emu as her. He referred to the emu as he or him. Emus sort of have what you might consider reverse gender roles. The male emus actually help rear the young. They sit and incubate the eggs and help rear the young. And during the mating season, it's actually the female emus that chase around the male emus trying to pursue a mate. Um, with the Kamilaroi people, the same country that um, he was from, same language group, um, when the emu starts to rise this time of the year, they see it as a female emu running. But as the emu changes position in the sky, it becomes something slightly different. It becomes a male emu hatching the eggs. So that's the sort of practical aspect. And you find that in rock art. So, for example, in just north of Sydney, there's a big sandstone platform covered in these rock engravings. And one of them shows the emu in the sky. It's very, very famous now. It's a very beautiful image. But you also find lots of bark paintings and other forms of art that show the emu. Now, we talked about the emu laying their eggs as being a practical thing, so they were used as a food source. In Victoria, the emu was called chingal. And uh, the sun, Nabi, was actually one of the eggs of the emu. But there's also a social aspect, and that relates to how the male emus help incubate the eggs and rear the young. So the emu in the sky was related to male initiation ceremony. Now I won't go into too much detail about what that is because some of that is actually secret. Um, a lot of the ab aboriginal traditional knowledge is considered secret. So some of that might be restricted to men, considered men's business, or restricted to women, be women's business, and some of it just you can't know unless you're initiated. But the basic idea is that these initiation sites where boys were taught all the customs, the laws, traditions, they had to perform all the dances, recite all the stories. These were done at these big ceremonies. And in southeastern Australia, down where Sydney and Melbourne are and Brisbane, you had what's called a Bora ceremony. A Bora is the name that also comes from the Camilleroy. You had two usually made of earth, um, you know, maybe 20, 30 meters across. So it's a slightly bigger circle and a smaller circle some distance away that was connected by a pathway that went through the bush, through the, the woods, as you might call it, in the States. The big circle was where the main part of the ceremony happened. Then the men, the senior elders, would take the boys up to the small circle to do the rest of the ceremony, which was considered secret and sacred. But this bore ground was reflected in the sky. So you'd see these dark spaces in the Milky Way in part of the emu that were reflected on the ground during the Bora ceremony. So these Bora ceremonies tend to be held at times of the year when the emu in the sky, the Bora sky, sorry, the Bora in the sky, were reflected on the ground. So this had a couple of different components. So the, the male emus helping to rear the young was symbolic of the men in the community bringing the boys into manhood. So it was 
really had a lot of different parts to it. So that's one example of a dark sky constellation um, of the famous emu component and the social component. But there's mm. another story from Arnhem Land that talks about two brothers who were fishing in a canoe. They were far out at sea. Uh, unfortunately, a really bad storm hit them. This, this took place up in the eastern Arnhem Land, which is up in the top northeastern part of the Northern Territory, up in the, the very north tropics of the continent, um, of the young people. So the boys were out fishing in a canoe, and a really bad storm hit, and it capsized their boat. And The boys were trying to swim back as fast as they could to shore. Um, the younger brother was and just wasn't as strong as the older brother. The older brother tried to help him by getting him to shore, and he did manage to save him. But the older brother drowned in the process, so he gave his life for the younger brother. Um, when the older brother died, he appeared in the sky as a bright new star along the Sky River, the Milky Way. Many years later, when he grew old and finally died, he asked for the ancestor to place him in the sky next to his older brother. So the two brothers can be seen today as the stars Shala and Asaph, the stingers of the scorpion in, in Western astronomy, right near the bank of the Sky River, the Milky Way. And we've got a bark painting here that shows that. So there are the two brothers standing up on top. Below that, what you're seeing there is the Milky Way itself. And that sort of big bulky part in the middle is the center of the Milky Way galaxy with the two sort of uh, disks going out on either side of that. You can see inside the middle of that the canoe and the boys being capsized in the boat and trying to swim back. So there are a lot of different variations of the story in Arnold Man. And sometimes the brothers actually both die. It just varies on, on which community tells the story. But... In general, the, the two brothers are both there. So you see a lot of... This is a more modern, recent bar painting of this story. Mm -hmm. So what I hope I've been able to do today is, is give you a little bit of an idea of a couple of different Aboriginal views of the night sky. And I think now we're going to pass it over and uh, listen to well, some musical pieces that relate to yeah, Aboriginal let, astronomy. Yeah, let me ask you a couple of questions, Dwayne, while I have you here, and okay. maybe we'll get to some others later on, too, because everybody will stay on. So if you have questions, you can add them into the Q&A app there. It's interesting for those of us who are astronomers and, and for you when you went down to the south that the sky is essentially so bright with stars, so covered with stars, unlike in the north where we see a, a narrower, less uh, dense part of the Milky Way, that it actually becomes important where this continuity of, of uh, brightness is disrupted because we don't, you know, we have a few areas that we're used to seeing up here, but nothing like this. Uh, is that is that just simply a matter of the fact that the sky appears so different overhead, the Milky Way uh, very much different? Is there anything in in the culture that would account for that, or that is drawn from that? Just this, it's sort of a negative of what what we view here. Well, the, the southern hemispheres tilt a little bit more towards the galactic plane. And, of course, we can see the, the Magellanic Clouds, the two dwarf galaxies that are, you know, down south of the Milky Way, if you will. So we get amazing views of, of the night sky here. But it's interesting you ask that because in some Aboriginal cultures, for example, in the Central Desert, there is an area called a town. It's actually a missionary called Hermansburg or Antharia. And that's sort of on the border of the Aranda and the Luritja people. And a uh, paper was published about 1932 or so that talked about their astronomy. And they actually have the Milky Way at, I believe it's the autumn, about this time of the year, is directly overhead. And it separates the two different views of the sky. So one half of the sky is Arinda country. The other half of the sky is Luritja country. And the middle is where the two intersect. That's because the language group actually intersects right there. But you get a lot of amazing stories about... Um, all different areas of the of the sky down here, and it, like I said, it's quite different up there. As you mentioned, it's, it's quite crowded actually, but you get tremendous diversity in the stories. And in some areas, um, the early colonists said that the Aboriginal people had a story for every single star in the night sky. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, today we don't know about many of them, which is why it's so exciting for those of us doing research to go out and speak with the community members, with the elders and even sit in libraries digging away in archives because we find yeah. a tremendous wealth of information all the time. 
Well, that's certainly a different way of looking at the sky. Uh, we don't nearly as much, if at all, have a connection like that where geographic borders and uh, night sky borders intersect. It's, it's, all, it's, it's as though there's more of a connection with the night sky. And perhaps it's just, of course, that's changed in the last hundred years since we have artificial lights. But maybe it was uh, even more important to the Aboriginal people of Australia and others in the South because it was even more prominent than it is here. Um, let me ask you uh, one other thing also, uh, just about the emu in the sky. Now, that's one I have heard of before, but you talked about all the different types of Aboriginal people. Is this one that transcends most of the cultural um, uh, traditions, uh, is well known throughout many of them, or is it this also fragmented where some, some know of this and, and others uh, have some other different uh, story about that area of the sky? We've we've been quite surprised to learn this is almost universal. Not universal, but almost universal. We find this all across the country. So we even, you know, from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. Now the emu might be viewed in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. um, in some countries, you know, the, the shape of the emu is a little bit different. And those dark spaces in the Milky Way could also represent crocodiles, kangaroos, serpents, a whole slew of other animals, or even like, like the coal sack, the head of the emu in the central desert represents a cave in which an evil spirit dwells. And if you break law and traditions, he'll throw a fiery stone out of the and kills people. But you do find this all across um, Australia. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, you actually find this in other continents as well. So in South America, um, the northern indigenous Bolivians see this as a raya, a bird very similar to an ostrich and emu. And an emu. Mm -hmm. um, in northern, I'm sorry, in Peru, they actually see it as a llama where the two pointer stars are actually the eyes of the llama. So it's not even unique necessarily to Australia. You find it in South America as well. And I believe you actually find it in Africa with mm -hmm. the ostriches. Does this uh, fact that it's uh, spread out pretty widely in Australia imply that it's one of the older traditions? It's had time to be incorporated in more cultures? Uh, that is possible. Um, I also think that you, know, you look at the sky, you see a familiar shape that it sticks in your mind. When you see the silhouette of the emu in the sky, it, there's no mistaking what it looks like. It absolutely looks like somebody took a photo okay. of an emu and just stuck it up in the sky. So when you look, it's, it's as clear as day. So as long as you have a part of the country and you look at an emu and you look at the sky, there's no doubt what you're looking at. It's very, gotcha. very clear. Interesting. Uh, one other quick question before we move on to Matthew here. We have a question from Ben who asks if there is any Aboriginal uh, oral history related to Halley's Comet, which of course we have recordings of in many cultures back through time. That's a very good question. I actually published a paper looking at comets in Aboriginal culture. Um, a lot of the times we don't have a time stamp for when these oral traditions originated. Um, sometimes an astronomical event can be the, the origin of a new tradition. Sometimes it could be incorporated into a pre-existing story or oral tradition. Um, oddly enough, I really didn't find many that specifically noted Halley's Comet. There were several that could represent Halley's Comet, but um, in 1910, um, when Halley's Comet came around, so the last one was 1986, previously it was 1910, um, Halley's Comet was, was visible, um, I think, March or April, something like that. And some anthropologists were trying to determine the ages of some of the elder men, and they did that by whether the men could remember Halley's Comet. But as it turned out, what they were describing wasn't Halley's Comet. It was the Great Comet of 1910 that happened in January, and it was much brighter and much more prominent than Halley's Comet. So they were saying they remembered this comet in 1910, and the anthropologists thought they meant Halley's Comet. But when they described what it looked like and that it was early in the year, in January, they realized they were talking about the Great Comet of 1910. But there is an Aboriginal organization in the Northern Territory that uses an artistic drawing of Halley's Comet as their logo. Mm -hmm. So th th there is a little bit out there, but we, we don't know if there are other older traditions. I'm sure there are, but we just haven't uh, been able to make that connection between the comet and the comet tradition and Halley's Comet yet, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Of course, you're in a unique position because you have a advanced training in both astronomy and uh, in Aboriginal cultures. So you'd be able to recognize some of these things before uh, specialists in either one field alone would be able to. 
So thanks very much, Dwayne. Uh, if there are any other questions for Dwayne, please put them into the Q&A app. But I want to move on now to Matthew Whitehouse, who's an organist, a composer. He has a uh, doctor of music degree from Arizona, University of Arizona, if I got that right, uh, Matthew. But he is also an amateur astronomer. He does a lot of astronomy outreach, so he's very much an astronomy educator. So he's also one at the intersection of two uh, different fields, in this case in, in the arts and in science. So uh, Matthew joins us from South Carolina State Museum in Columbia, South Carolina. Matthew, welcome. And I think uh, Matthew might have his microphone muted. Hello, Matthew. Okay, so our, our um, brilliant... Uh... Matthew, hover your mouse over this window and see if the microphone uh, icon at the top is in orange. Um, if it's orange, click it to turn it white. If it's already white, shake your head frantically at us. Okay, um, for some reason we lost your microphone. Um, Okay, so this is the voice in the sky here that we're hearing is Pamela Kay of CosmoQuest, our brilliant producer for this, uh, who I'd like to acknowledge even though uh, she hasn't shown herself yet, but uh, she has a great voice for at least coming on and telling us what's going on. Uh, Pamela, should uh, I can move along to uh, talk to uh, Bob while you work with Matthew and see if you can get that worked out? Sounds good. <clears throat> okay, so, so Bob Eklund you are going to be next up here. So Bob is somebody I've known for a long time. He's an astronomy enthusiast, has been his whole life. He grew up in part uh, at his, uh, at a relative's house. Was it your, your uncle? I forget it. Yerkes Observatory. I've known him in the Los Angeles Astronomical Society here at Mount Wilson Observatory as part of the, uh, the um, Mount Wilson Observatory Association where he still continues. But Bob also has a long history of enjoying astronomy through the arts, in his case, uh, literary. And he is a poet. He loves haiku, in fact, and is, is pretty good with that. He's published his own astral poetry uh, in a book. And uh, he's got a couple of poems from Aboriginal peoples, I believe, that relate to the sky uh, that he'd like to read for us, too. So, Bob. Uh, Go ahead and tell us tell us what you think of these and what they mean. Thank you, Mike. Are, are you hearing me? Uh, is my microphone live? Uh, Pamela? You're loud and clear. Loud and clear. Good. Okay. And I think um, uh, I might I would say that Matthew's microphone might be working because I think I can hear him typing. So, uh, Matthew, do you hear us now? Uh, how are you hearing me? Yeah, we're hearing you fine. So, Matthew, <laughs> stand by. <laughs> now that we've introduced Bob, it sounds like you guys have gotten it fixed. But let's let Bob go ahead with his uh, his poems here because he has two poems, and we'll do that, and we'll come back to you in just a minute. That's he great. Verify behind the scenes, everything is working there. So, Bob. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, I have uh, I picked out two poems uh, that are sort of uh, <clears throat> different but similar in a way also. Um, the first one is from, um, actually from, the, <clears throat> um, kind of rewritten in a poetic form from a uh, one of the traditions, uh, the, the, the songs, the stories of, uh, uh, it, from the Wadaman tribe. Uh, that's Wadaman, I'm not quite sure what part of Australia that is, but this is, um, <clears throat> this one, the actual poem was written by Bill Har Harney and A.P. Elkin, uh, who were researchers that went out and, and talked to the uh, the people of the tribe. Did that in a number of different tribes and got uh, uh, oh several of these stories, which they rendered into poetry. Mm -hmm. um, this and one Bob, here. Uh, Bob, let me uh, just in, uh, interrupt you for a moment and say that our expert Dwayne has said that they are in the Northern Territory of Australia. So that answers your question, Bob where they are. Good, I was wondering, yeah, the Northern Territory, okay, Wadaman, <clears throat> and the, uh, this is the Wadaman tribe's idea of how the people on the earth will be destroyed. <clears throat> it is called 
Nada and Utjangan. The spot, or that spot, well known in the road on top, and let me interrupt myself to say that the road on top is the Milky Way. That spot well known in the road on top, the emu's head, or I should say emu's head, inset with light, a cavern is, and deep within, watching and looking on us below, spying and looking on us below, is Utjangan, our deadly foe. Tis he that comes, a giant star, striking the earth with a mighty roar, and as it trembles, trees all sway, and we too tremble, shout and cry, knowing our foe, we all would fly, we fear that all on earth will die. Utjangan is the old sky lord, sullen and silent he sits and waits, awaiting signs from us below. A native points, then calls the name of bad men here. At sound of same, strikes Utjangan a fiery flame. If we down here ignore the laws formed by men in the old dream time, to hold him back by ceaseless watch, from his cave he springs with hissing sound, making the echoing hills resound, while not a stern roars neath the ground. This earth is shaped as a mighty shield, which rests on the head of the giant bold. Nada is he who holds us up, tis he who holds our destiny. The dream time law, our destiny, if we forget, we cease to be. For Utjangan is the deadly foe of Nada, bearer of the earth. If ever they clash in that great fight, this earth will waver, sway, and turn. Hills and trees will topple and turn, the moon grow dim, the sun not burn. Then all our shouts will be in vain, the struggle will go on to the end. Midst lightning flashes, thunders roar, the totem men will tramp again. Dreamtime heroes march again, while we of this earth shall all be slain. Nada will win, but he will throw the earth away and we shall be down underneath the bottom here. We will be gone, be down below. The earth upturned, the shades below will flourish on earth, their numbers grow. Old Utjangan is our deadly foe. He knows the laws of the dreaming time. With eyes fixed on the fiery star, we on earth must watch and wait. We of the tribe must watch and wait for the star may strike and the time be late. So people listen, we all shall go. As our springs have dried and the seasons changed, we smile because that day will come when we are gone. It will fall here and topple the earth as it strikes here. Then you will totter and shake with fear. For Utjangan is your deadly foe, watching alert for the time to spring. It is only we who know the law who hold him there in the old sky track. Without us, none can hold him back. Then he springs and all goes black. This earth will shudder, the trees come down, and over the noise you will hear our cry. We'll cry for you as you pass away. We'll laugh at you as you pass away. Then night descends, so fades our day. And that's the end. That's uh, that's wonderful, Bob. It is uh, hard to imagine more of a connection between Earth and sky than that. Uh, yes. <laughs> when when was this poem written? Do you have any information on that? Um. Yes, the the, the um, book that this is taken from was published in 1949, so I, I it couldn't have been later than that, and I imagine that it was probably in the 1940s that these uh, these two gentlemen, Bill Harney and, and A. P. Elkin, went out and interviewed the elders or something to uh, get to get the story. So it was it would have been about that time. Yeah, so it's really uh, looking back to uh, previous times. It's a uh, 
sort of uh, uh, a history, an oral history in a sense. Yes, looking at that, that poem and thinking of the idea of a, a bolt from the sky, uh, of course, makes me think of, um, of meteors, obviously, um, <laughs> meteorites, large meteorites perhaps, and I'm thinking that in the, uh, in the many thousands of years, I forget how many thousands of years, Dwayne, you said the Aboriginal people have been uh, living on Australia, but it's, it's a great many, more than 50,000, I think. Um, they, they must have witnessed yeah. some pretty large, uh, not, not only meteor strikes, but perhaps asteroid strikes and comet strikes and that sort of thing, too. Maybe something as big as the Tunguska impact or something like that. So it's no wonder that they would, would get this idea of disaster falling from the sky. Yeah, and, um, and Dwayne Edds uh, has commented uh, here that, that that includes Henbury and, and Boxhall, some uh, well-known uh, impact craters. So they certainly have seen a great deal happen over the years, and if they have a continuous oral history, those would be retained. So Right. And as um, I noted, I, I noticed in... Uh, in Duane's uh, paper about comets, uh, uh, that there is a place in Western Australia where um, there's something called Comet Rock that uh, uh, possibly has inscriptions and things on it, but it, the, uh, um, it has uh, ocean sands around it, and it's about five kilometers away from the ocean. So the speculation is that there has been a tsunami in that area that brought sand up to that that area five kilometers away, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it could have been a comet impact into the ocean, although we know that most tsunamis we've seen lately, at least, are from uh, underwater um, uh, earthquakes. It is right. possible that something struck the ocean there and caused that, that tsunami. Anyway, um, just in a more sorry. kind of a... Bob, it's, it's, I, sorry to interrupt. Um, I want to get back to Matthew, so we are sure to have time uh, for him. I understand you have another poem as well. Uh, oh, sure. Let's, okay, well, let's, let's go to the second poem, and we'll get Matthew on. Yeah, now the second well, poem is from... Uh, now, yes, I want to give Matthew a chance to do his mu music here, uh, and if we have time, we'll, we'll come back. Go to Matthew now? And, yeah, yeah, if, uh, if, if that's okay, and we'll come back, and we can get some commentary, I think, from Duane as well. Okay, so... One of the other archetypal stories in uh, Australian indigenous uh, mythology and lore is that of the Seven Sisters, you know, the Pleiades star cluster. And in a lot of the uh, Aboriginal groups, the Pleiades are, are thought of, or the Seven Sisters are thought of as a, a group of women being chased across the landscape by Orion. And uh, I actually did some research for my doctoral dissertation of music associated with the Pleiades from around the world, and I, I wanted to focus on Australia. And this resulted in a piece uh, for solo pipe organ called the Pleiades Visions. And what we're going to hear in a few minutes is just the opening of the first part of this piece, which is entitled Uluru, Uluru being the aboriginal word for Ayers Rock. and uh, this piece is very loosely based on melodies associated with the Seven Sisters from the musical traditions of the uh, Pijantajara peoples, which are the uh, indigenous group native to the area around Uluru. And one of the things I wanted to highlight with this is that I wanted to be very careful not to actually appropriate the melodies or the Dreamtime mythology of an Aboriginal group. I wanted to do this in a manner that is as culturally sensitive as possible. So for example, this is no attempt to depict uh, mythology or lore associated with the Seven Sisters, which in many Aboriginal groups is women's business. So what you're about to hear is really much more about the vast uh, desert landscape surrounding Uluru. Uh, it's also very much about the, say, the colors that reflect off of Uluru from the sunset. You'll hear some really colorful sounds from the organ, giving that sense of the intense color that you see uh, uh, at sunrise or sunset um, around Uluru. So let's go on and cue this up, and we'll show a picture of Uluru as we're listening.
Wow, well, Matthew, that's, uh, you know, the word that comes to mind is evocative. Uh, I, I've never been to Uluru, uh, formerly known as Ayers Rock, but it's it's clear from all the pictures I've seen that it's something that rises almost mystically out of an otherwise really, really flat area. Uh, music, to me, does sound like nighttime music, uh, almost eerie. Um, Am I getting the, the right feelings from some of this? Absolutely. So it's very much about that vast landscape and about the night sky view. And if we go on and listen to the rest of the piece, the um, actual uh, landform of Uluru kind of rises out of the desert. And then there are various allusions in the piece to um, more of that night sky view. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was just the opening of the piece. Again, really no Aboriginal legend, some influence from uh, Aboriginal music, but in a very loose kind of way, because I really didn't want to be appropriating lock, stock, and barrel, what is really, frankly, a, uh, someone else's intellectual property. Right, right. And for those who want to hear the rest of Matthew's piece, that just being the beginning of it, you can go to www.matthewwhitehouse.com and you'll find uh, his work there as well as other things too. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious, Dwayne, do you, I, I don't know if you've heard uh, Matthew's piece before, or you have any comments on uh, what you think of it or how this strikes you in terms of the, um, you know, evoking the, um, uh, 
feeling of uh, Uluru or how it might relate in some way to the views of uh, the Aboriginal people? I've I've heard it before. I think it's a great piece. I've been to Uluru a couple of times, and I can just imagine this playing in the background as you're watching sun the sunset. I'm sorry, the sunrise over Uluru, which is a, a great place you can you can do that when you're when you're there. I haven't heard many of the songs from the Central Desert about the Seven Sisters dreaming. I've seen them written down, but as Matthew said, a lot of that is uh, women's business, women's stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we do take a we are planning to take a group of students um, out to the central desert as part of a university course I'm teaching. So I think it might be a good opportunity. If Matthew, you're happy, I'd I'd love to be able to play that music for them while we're watching Uluru. Sure, that would, be, that would be that would be wise. That'd be fantastic. I'd love to do that probably next year, but that'd be great. That sounds great. Report back. Um, you know, I have to ask, what would the Aboriginal people? think of this music. Clearly their music is on different instruments, a very different type of music, but music is in a way a universal language. And while some things may not be familiar to each of us, I love traditional musics of various kinds, and I get a message, some communication from all of them. What, what would they think of this if they were there at Uluru and, and listening to this? Any idea? Is that for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh. I have no idea. I really have no idea. <laughs> okay. I mean, this, this is a situation where, where a vast majority of, of Aboriginal people live in cities, so they're as familiar with this as anybody else, but I don't know what some of the more traditional communities would, would feel like. I have no idea. It would be interesting to find out. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you'll get that chance then. Uh, so, so, Matthew, uh, w what more do you have to tell us about the music? Do you have something you want to share with us about the Aboriginal music uh, that you're... Uh, being very careful not to appropriate. Well, sure. So the way uh, an Aboriginal melody works, especially from the Central Desert tribes, is that it tends to be this sort of repeating thing that descends. So it starts on a high note and, and goes down. And it turns out there's an, an, an ethnomusicologist named Catherine Ellis who did a lot of field work amongst the Pajentajara. And what she found is that different... Uh, melodies are actually associated with different Dreamtime heroes. So, Dwayne, feel free to jump in as I explain Dreamtime here, but this this idea of this time before time when totemic ancestors wandered the landscape, creating the world, creating animals, creating landforms, and some of these legends ended up in the sky. Uh, but it, it turns out that individual melodies that descend in different ways are connected with different dream time heroes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Catherine Ellis called this the concept of totemic melody, this idea that uh, there actually are specific melodies. So what you'll find are there are these long cycles of songs sung to these melodies that trace the movement of dream time uh, beings across the landscape. And so there is a, a long song series, for example, associated with the Seven Sisters. And what's interesting is if you look at the text, it references various locations. So you can draw these maps of uh, the movement of these Dreamtime heroes across the landscape. And these maps are called song lines. So fascinating tradition. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it very not very well known, I believe, for the reason that Dwayne mentioned these things, these songs are often say women's business. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course this uh, goes along with the poem that Bob read for us, talking about dream times as well, not breaking it down into different dream times, but uh, somewhat specific sort of a chapter out of all of this. Uh, that was a more recent uh, piece written in 1940, but alluding to all of these as well. So uh, these traditions, it seems to me, there is a, a really complex culture in which all of the arts and the physical space in which they are living are really integrated. So we have the night sky, we have the song, we have the uh, poems, uh, the uh, totems, and, and other things. And it just doesn't seem to be compartmentalized to me. that They, they all are related to others and, and in a way interact with each other in, in terms of the culture. And then dance is a big part, really. With for the uh, for many Aboriginal groups, the dance and music are, are very much intertwined. They're kind of one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, uh, what what do you think of that idea, um, Dwayne? Am I am I interpreting that somewhat correctly? Yeah. I mean, from what I understand about it, um, yes, that is. I mean, with these old oral cultures, you had story, you had song, you had dance, you had art forms, and they all interrelate. You're right. They were not compartmentalized. They were all integrated. They were all essentially part of the the culture that helped the people, you know remember these these important uh, bits of law and information for thousands of years. Well, and, and you know, what strikes me too is someone with a northern, well, modern northern hemisphere tradition with the sky is that for us it's somewhat separated. We have astronomy in all of our cultures everywhere and, and throughout time and we use the words a lot. I mean, we use stars for everything. We have cars named after uh, astronomical things. You see it everywhere if you if you look for it, but we don't have as much of a connection, uh, and that could be just the last hundred years because we don't see the night sky as much, uh, and, which is a real shame because it's a cultural tradition that we should be keeping too. Now, I'm in the United States where we have many different cultural traditions as well, uh, not so much for the peoples of the U.S. overall because we're made up of so many different people. So I find that fascinating. So uh, Bob, I'd like to come back to you. You have another poem for us, and maybe you can help take us out here with the uh, the poem that you you have ready. Tell us about what you have for us. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, I don't like to end this on a sad note, but the uh, this takes us to the the status and the plight of the contemporary um, ab Aboriginal community uh, today. Uh, and uh, you know there there have there's been an awful lot of of, uh, of discrimination and uh, uh, lack of understanding between the white majority and the Aboriginal people and and uh, they've been suffered a great deal. I looked at a hundred poems um, written by Aboriginal people, co contemporary ones, and every one of them reflected a great sadness and sorrow at, at their present uh, treatment and, and plight and so forth. Uh, but this one here, I think, has an a little bit of hope at the end, and it, it is a. Uh, uh, this is called "Late Years Away," and it's by Jonathan Hill. Uh, he is a teacher in a school at a place called o Old Arrowal Bay. That's Old Arrowal Bay, New South Wales, and uh, don't know if you know where that is, uh, Duane, but it's along the coast somewhere there. And uh, he also uh, volunteers a great deal to help the Aboriginal people who probably don't have jobs and are struggling with a great deal of difficulty. But he writes uh, this way, Light years away, my lifetime flickers in the fading light. I no longer have the will to fight. The battle continues till my dying day, forever forced to live the white man's way. The song lines and stories, the laws of the land, deemed mythical nonsense by those in command, now lost to eternity, perished and passed, making way for modernity a comical farce, a culture bound by desire, not need, ruled by the wealthy, infected with greed. The unifying power of the setting sun is proof humanity is collectively one, but such a realization is light years away. There's no profit to be made living the peaceful way. That's it. Well, that uh, certainly is sad in, in a number of ways, <clears throat> but there there is one, one bit of hope at the end, as you say. Uh, he alluded to something that is important in Astronomers Without Borders. As I say, we all we all share the same sky. We refer to uh, our motto, one people, one sky. And uh, Dwayne, you can address this better than the rest of us here since you are now transplanted uh, in, into Australia. But it seems to me there's been a lot more attention paid to the plight of the Aboriginal peoples, the indigenous peoples of Australia, and what has been lost by not paying enough attention to the cultures of those who went before and whatever cultures they are. Remember the uh, Olympic Games in Sydney had a really touching tribute to the Aboriginal people. And, and so I know there's an effort going on. The, this um, 
importance of the sky connecting the earth, which is something that we talk about in Astronomers Without Borders, we, wherever we are, we're sharing the same sky. North and south looks different, but, but it's the same idea, and that's what unites us and makes it successful. Um, you know, is, is the, the uh, recurring awareness of the uh, indigenous people's cultures, is, am I getting the right impression, and, and is that making any sort of a difference here that we can be helpful for the future? There, there does tend to be a bit of a negative twist put on indigenous culture, even by the press and the media. It always focuses on something negative. Um, mm -hmm. Not always, but many times on something negative. So what you're finding now is the trend is gradually going to a more positive angle, and astronomy seems to be one of the ways in which we're really being able to accomplish that successfully. Because everybody's interested in astronomy, which is why we're all here, um, it's a great way to engage the public about indigenous culture and science together. And we're looking at the convergences of traditional indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge and finding ways that we can work together, learn from each other, to find a mutually beneficial future. And I think that's having a significant impact. And the, the interest in this sort of thing is really taking off in recent years. So I hope that trend continues. And, um, you know, we're, we're working more to train more indigenous students in this area themselves. So instead of hearing a white American talk about indigenous culture, you actually have indigenous people talking about that. And there are plenty out there who do, but uh, we're getting more students, um, indigenous students in our group who are going to become the voices of the future in this area. Mm -hmm. Well, if we go back far enough, you know, that's the one thing that we have in common. Everybody around the world is uh, the, the night sky. Um, and our cultures all have roots in it together, so let's hope that that can play a part. Um, and uh, this is an important part of it, and I agree. I, I have seen uh, uh, countries, people in countries who have suffered a great deal in wars with each other, who don't talk to each other in other ways, be united by their common interest in astronomy and realize that we're just all the same people on the other side of some geopolitical border maybe on another continent, but um, that we're otherwise all the same, and we have the same response to these really primal interests going back uh, to our roots and uh, in the night sky. So let's hope that's able to, to play a part. So on that somewhat hopeful, yeah, I hope not naive, uh, note, uh, I think our hour is up, so I'd like to thank everybody who has watched and those of you who are watching uh, on YouTube after the fact. This will continue to be available online for some time. You can go to Astronomers Without Borders, uh, our website too, to see other things in the Astro Arts program. There are other hangouts, but many uh, featured astro artists every month bring in some really innovative and interesting uh, perspectives on the combination of our culture and our interest in what we usually view as a science that is astronomy. So, uh, and also I'd like to mention that this month, April, is Global Astronomy Month, which is a the world's largest celebration, uh, annual celebration of the night sky in many forms, including hangouts like this, as well as others, uh, many science programs, observing programs, outreach, and Meant much more, and there are still some special surprise events to be announced that you'll be able to watch online as well. So I want to thank our guests, Wayne, Bob, Matthew, and especially Pamela Gay, the lovely voice from above, who, who occasionally will have to come in and tell us what to do. Pamela is in her office producing all of this behind the scenes, so when you get a chance for her, there she is. Pamela, are you showing yourself? I, I am. I, I uh, brought myself back in to say, uh, everyone go out, look up. If it's cloudy, go online, and remember there's science everywhere. And CosmoQuest. At CosmoQuest.org is Pamela's organization, Astronomers Without Borders, and CosmoQuest partner, to try and do what we can to bring astronomy to people and bring people together. In CosmoQuest's case, uh, citizen science, and much more. So join the community, take part, uh, contribute, donate if you can. We all need it. So thank you, Pamela, and everyone else, and good night or good morning, whichever the case may be for you. And watch Mars tonight. It's the closest it's been for several years.
And we also had, uh, I'll just mention, Pamela, because you mentioned Mars. Just before this, we had a live program watching Mars from the virtual telescope of Dr. Gianluca Massi in, uh, in Italy. That should be archived and on his site. We'll get that out, too, on our site. So if you missed the live program, he's fantastic. So you'll get a chance to see that as well. I think we can say good, goodbye now because Pamela and I will just bring up all kinds of things. <laughs> good night and clear skies. <laughs> good night.